William Hopley, your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. Welcome to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet, and I'm here in the studio with one of three black Trump supporters in the state of Texas, Lauren Landis. I, and I, must not, I must not be black. <laughs> <laughs> Get that straight right away. And uh, Ken, Star, Ken Star enthusiast and, and Baylor alum, the late Patty Fink. Right, right. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I'm from Baylor, right? right? You know what my school did this week? What? Uh, canceled its game against um, uh, North Carolina. North Carolina, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Because I went to school in New York and it was a state school, no travel, no official travel to North Carolina. Uh, your school, they did the same? No, in fact, um, our new um, um, football, uh, head of the football team, uh, coach. said, Coach, thank See, you. I know <laughs> Use your words, Patty. It was just what my my wife says. Um, um, he um, basically said there's no bad culture at, at Baylor, and I'm like, oh my god, this is just getting worse every time they open their mouth. How many rapes? Worse. Uh, let's not even go there. And Ken Starr's still teaching at the law school. Mm-hmm. It's a big mess. Uh, well, yeah, well, I would know. think he'd have a lot to contribute. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> okay, uh, we are we are talking today about aging in the LGBT community. Yesterday, the second annual uh, summit on LGBT aging was held up at the SMU campus in Collin County. And you know how pretty the SMU campus is in Dallas, and how it really looks like a traditional campus. I have to say, the SMU campus in Plano blends. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great facility. It oh, really it's, is. It's cookie cutters, cookie cutter houses, oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah. plastic. Yeah, big, let's be big nice. Box. Let's be nice. I, I really like the mayor. <laughs> I really do. We and we're, we're going to have him on soon. I have to get back in touch with him, but he's going to be our guest. He's a great guy. Have you met um, Henry? No. You're going to love him. Um, anyway, our guests today are Portia Cantrell. She's a retired nurse. Sam Tornabene. He is retired from advertising public relations. Uh, Bart Poche is the young whippersnapper on the panel today. Uh, <laughs> smart-ass U- UNT researcher. And uh, we also have Cannon Flowers, who's actually retired so long, nobody remembers what he actually did. <laughs> And now, we love them all. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, now, uh, tur- everybody turn off your beepers <laughs> so that we don't make noise during the show. Uh, we're going to have plenty of bathroom breaks. Don't worry about it. And um, we will talk slow and loud so that our guests can answer us. Okay, Patty? Got it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday was very serious. Uh, that they weren't expecting today wasn't going to be quite as... I think Cannon was. No, he was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you know. <laughs> he told us this isn't a credibility show for us. Right. He was right. right. Oh, Our I credibility, see. not yours. Oh, Ours, right. not yours. Um, well, you'll know better next time. <laughs> Now, I do. I want to start with Portia. Portia, um, in this week's Dallas Voice, we were talking, uh, and I wrote a story around something that happened to her. One of the things about aging in the LGBT community is that there are some specific things that you have to worry about and, um, you know, lack of socialization, lack of um, uh, specific things for us that are that even take gay and lesbian people into consideration. You recently had a procedure at an, at an area hospital, Portia. Tell us what happened, because 
well, this could happen to anybody in the LGBT community, any age. It happened to you. It did. And, and tell, tell us what happened. I went to the hospital, and during the, um, during the pre-procedure, they ask you different questions, and one of the specific questions they ask, which is really important, who is your emergency contact? I was very proud to say that my emergency contact is Tanya Carter, who is my wife. Well, throughout the rest of the conversation with the nurse that was taking care of me, she kept referring to it as my friend. Now, I was already stressed because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a nurse. I know everything that could possibly go wrong. But then when she kept saying it was my friend as opposed to my wife, that made me feel even worse. But on the other hand, I was afraid to speak out about it because this was also the nurse that was going to be taking care of me after the procedure. And I started panicking, thinking if I say something, what if she, what if she gets mad? If I tell somebody, what if she doesn't take care of me? What if she forgets to take my blood pressure? What if she gives me something that I shouldn't have? So all these things were racing through my head. What if she just decides... Oh, the patient in the next bed is more important. Yeah, she's calling. I can get to her when when I'm free. Exactly. Exactly. Be because you have to prioritize what you do. You don't want to be the one who's uh, oh, she's trouble. And and that's a very reasonable thing because that's how you can explain it. If something went wrong. Using her nursing judgment, she could always say, well, I thought Mr. So-and-so in the next bed actually needed my attention at that particular moment. So it was very frightening. And, and you know more about that because you're a nurse yourself. Correct. Um, and I think that's a big, a big issue, I think, with LGBT people in general. It's not just places like North Carolina where we get literally denied service, but sometimes if, if someone knows and you're not confident or comfortable with them um, in the way they, they're treating you, are they going to give me substandard service? Are they going to give me harmful service? Yes. You know, like even if even dropping off your car at the shop, you know, they say, well, I'm really not going to tighten that bolt because I don't like gay people. Mm -hmm. And again, like you, you said, know? you were already under stress because of the procedure from get-go. Right. You know, let's stress anybody out. And then you have to worry about one more thing on top of that. You know, you're not, you're basically you were, being, you were being disrespected. Yes. And, and blackmailed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically. Mm -hmm. It's like you will be silent about your life. Um, because I have the power. You know, I mean, that's really kind of what it is. And I was actually kind of ashamed that I didn't speak up, but I was really afraid. Mm -hmm. And I knew better. It, it, and, you know, uh, my husband was in Baylor about a year ago. Uh, for, again, it was an emergency procedure. And, you know, I said my husband's, because uh, I... I left him, and we knew it was going to be a while till the doctor saw him, but it was better that he was there than home. So he's just waiting in a room. I went off, did a couple of things, came right back, and I said, my husband's in there. I need to get in. Oh, just a second. We'll tell you, yeah, who's your husband? Is it? And they used all the right words, all the right, you know, and they were so welcoming, and it was so easy. It was so easy for them to do. And it would have been so easy for her to pick up on the wording right away and just put your mind at ease. I'm here to be your caregiver, yeah. which is the way it should be. So um, let's go to Bart. Um, Bart is a researcher at UNT, like I said. And um, your studies are, and, and if Bart sounds familiar, he was with us. He was actually our first in-studio guest here in the new studio um, back last fall. He was. That's right. Um, so you knew. You knew all along it was not going to be serious. I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so while we're not being serious, I wanted to, this is the, like the most boring question I could possibly ask anybody. I was going to have you give us some statistics on LGBT aging, the LGBT community, just here in North Texas and then in Texas. Um, well, we have uh, what is approaching in North Texas just under about 200,000 uh, LGBT people aged 45 and older. Um, at around the year 2030, which is a huge number. It's essentially the size of a small uh, or medium-sized city of gay people that we have. Um, and I think it's a, it's a huge number, and I think when you think of it that way, it kind of puts things into perspective. If you think of it as an entire city and what resources cities provide and what people on that scale need, and then, of course, you add in that this is an aging population, 
um, there's a, there will be a tremendous need for all kinds of resources, whether they're social services, housing, um, advocacy efforts that are going to be needed. This is a really large number of people. And so we talk a lot about um, the, the way to address this issue is really not to start now in building a bunch of gay community centers or looking for, you know, how to construct a bunch of gay assisted living places, although we do hope to see some of those. And really the the way to accommodate this number of people, and that's just North Texas that we're talking about, is really looking at ways to integrate all the services, all the places and spaces that are available right now um, so that they are available to, attractive to, and welcoming for LGBT people. So one of the uh, really great things that the Coalition for Aging tries to do is work with existing organizations, whether it is existing LGBT-focused organizations on how to become more... Um, knowledgeable about and capable of working with aging populations or if it's working with existing aging centers and services and teaching them how to be um, more knowledgeable about and concerned for LGBT people. And we have a, a few successes we're really proud of that really just start from very open dialogue about where do you think where do you think you are right now in your organization as far as ability to address the needs of LGBT people. Um, privately, confidentially, so we really can have honest conversation about. And so what do you think needs to be the first steps for your organization? So um, the idea is essentially we can't build it, we have to integrate it. Everything that we are building now, whether it's new services or facilities, really has to be done with this um, goal of making it a welcoming space for all. Um, LGBT is not specific to an ethnicity or a religious background or a socioeconomic status. It's a very diverse group of people. And so uh, to really be an organization or to provide a service that caters to the total LGBT organization requires a lot of sensitivity, a lot of knowledge, a lot of introspection about your own organization. And so that's what we try to um, help people understand. You, you mentioned um, existing um Facilities. Have you had dialogue with existing facilities, um, and have they been receptive to that dialogue? The good news is the ones that we have uh, been speaking with so far, and we're in this pilot stage of the um, Senior Living Equality Index that Cannon was talking about, is these are organizations, and, and the people that we're talking to, for the most part, are gay themselves. So they are in management, or they're involved in direct service in those organizations. So A, they're knowledgeable, B, they're concerned, and two, they have a position within their organization um, um, in which they can really impact change there. So that's great as far as um, what we need in terms of uh, creating this process, this scorecard. That's a wonderful place to start. Of course, the, those are not the places we're concerned about. The places we're concerned about are those that uh, either just through um, ignorance or not thinking about it, lack of education, are not doing a great job for LGBT people, are not actively recruiting LGBT people, um, or if there is some genuine resistance because of who knows the company that owns them. Well, a lot of them are religiously exactly. affiliated, and their religion doesn't particularly accept. Exactly, and those are of course the ones that you do worry the most about, and the ones that will be the most uh, difficult to engage with and to get in the door with, and really to help change. So, um, yeah, the the welcome so far has been great because that's of who that's because of who we've been talking to, um, but they're the ones that are going to help us get ready for those that really do need some change. So you have, you've had these conversations with um, some LGBT people who work in some of these facilities. Um, do they feel that they have a long way to go to, to be welcoming, or are they, do they think they're already there? They're very honest about the challenges they face. Um, so often these are, and, and the other thing that you really do care a lot about are those organizations that cater to a low socioeconomic status uh, population. Um, in those places, staffing is a real big issue. There's lots of turnover. Pay is not great. Sometimes the job is harder in those facilities than in others. And so what you really care about isn't so much the support of the leadership in your organization um, or the people that we know, you know, that work in marketing. What you really care about are those frontline folks that are really hands-on helping um, people in the um, in the home, and that's a really difficult group when it comes to, I mean, any organization where you have that kind of turnover, training and education, really difficult to keep up. Um, so it's not so much that we, that um, we're concerned with these few organizations about getting in, it's that it really is a big challenge on how you keep that workforce through recruiting and hiring and training um, in a place where they're going, we know they're going to be the right people to 
work with LGBT residents. You know, when my father was in a nursing home, he was uh, in for Alzheimer's memory care. And I got a call, and the place he was in was just great. It was not, it was very medium priced, very affordable. Yeah. Um, but it was not one of the lower end ones that you're talking about. Anyway, I got to, they communicate regularly, and I got a call one day, we have something we have to ask you. And I said, what? He said, well, your father met someone. And I said, well, that's nice. I said, Is everything okay? And she said, well, they've been spending the night in the same room. I said, ooh, is that a problem? And she said, well, not for us, but sometimes the family doesn't like it. And I said, the family doesn't like it? What, are you kidding? You know, and uh, she said, no, very often the family objects to that. I said, object to it. I said, I hope my genes came from that side of the family. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but... You know, and that was in a heterosexual situation. You have to wonder. Well, yeah. It, yeah. When what would it be on? like if your father had met a man, right? And wanted to, and had been spending the night. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 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 Yeah. And one of the problems, and Portia, I want you to address this because this goes to what you were talking about. One of the problems in nursing homes is that people who were out, they're, they're gay, they're lesbian, they're transgender. When they're in the nursing home, they hide. They go into the closet. Or they, the, the term that I've always heard is they go back into the closet. Tell me about that. How do you do that? You hide everything that could identify you as being, as being gay. Mm -hmm. So you don't put out pictures. You don't, of course, we're not going to have our little, what I call, flying my colors. We're not going to put our rainbow flags out. And we're especially especially not going to look at that cute older woman that's toddling down the hallway and say, I wish I could get to know her better, because that's going to make people feel uncomfortable. It may or it may not, but when you're in that environment, you're going to think they're watching me, so I have to be careful, so I can't be me. You know, and, and when I heard the idea of going back into the closet, my initial reaction to that was, well, I can't do that because I was never in the closet. Mm -hmm. Couldn't find it. I, I couldn't find it, didn't know where, <laughs> don't know where it is. <laughs> you know, if anybody asked anything about me, what did you do? I wrote a free gay paper. Oh, I had a gay radio show. Uh, I lived in Oak Lawn. It, it, it's very hard for me to hide who I am if I answer a question at all. But you're saying people just become so private and withdrawn that it's to the point of it not being healthy. It'll affect their health. Of course it will. Because if you can't express who you are and what you are, then you might as well wither up and die. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a nursing home environment, anywhere you're taken away from everybody and everything that you know and love, if you can't even express your inner feelings or put out the pictures of the people that you used to be involved with, you just give up. Right. Yeah. We need to take a break. You're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with Lauren Landis and the late Patty Fink. Our guests are, we've been talking to, we'll have two others come up in just a minute. We've been talking to Portia Cantrell and uh, Bart Poche. Uh, two more old people in just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dallas City Councilman Adam Medrano, and you're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON-FM. Welcome back to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet, and I don't know why that player is playing over and over again because it was set on single play. Anyway, uh, I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with Leron Landis and the late Patty Fink. Uh, we're talking about old people today. <laughs> so, Leron, I know you have a question Ask it slowly. Okay. Can you coming, hear me? Yeah, they can. But coming to the mic is Cannon Flowers. <laughs> He's retired from Texas Instruments yeah. back when their only product was transistor radios. <laughs> and speaking spells. <laughs> well, speaking <laughs> spells. You, 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 we did see. make that for ET, you That's know. That's right, right. <laughs> And, right, uh, we did. Uh, also, and uh, Sam Tornabene, he's a retired advertising and public relations executive. How's that? 
That, that, that's good. Okay. That's good. Yeah. And, and I'm not quite 60, and I'm trying to pass for 58. I, you know, so I'm, you, I'm making fun of all them. I'm probably the I oldest one here. I wouldn't be making fun of them. Get out. <laughs> there are many fears about for a, a lot of us uh, just about getting older, you know, having to take more meds. You know, is, is your mind going to slip? Um, and, Never. you know. <laughs> Well, I'm listening to this and going, and Aaron and I are like, going like, like the other day. <laughs> are you yeah. already there? Oh, we're already like chasing the words. Are you guys doing that? It's yeah. like suddenly the words are just like, what is that? You know, we're <laughs> talking about something and it's like, use your words. Uh, Patty, a number yeah. of years ago, you noticed that I put down, I write LeBron and, <laughs> and Patty on my paper. He writes down, my name is David Jeff on a piece of paper every week. <laughs> And now we know why. <laughs> and now spell it phonetically. Uh, no, I don't. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that, that'll be next year. Yeah. So, you know, have, being a, a part or involved in the LGBT uh, uh, as a couple, and you know, go, living in um, a nursing home or assisted living facility, that's one more la- layer of fear. And, you know, before the show, we talked about how has marriage equality changed this? Because when last year when, when, when Kenan was on, I know we talked a lot about one of the most common fears and or complaints is having a same-sex couple in the same room at a living facility. And sometimes that they're just not going to happen. But how has marriage equality changed that it is law now? You can't separate, or I would think, you can't separate a married couple, regardless of if, if it's two men, two women, or a man and a woman. They do very often when it's a man and a woman. Mm. Some facilities just aren't equipped for that. So, so that's another challenge. Can we talk about that and what, what steps are, or how, how you are attacking that? Do you want to address them? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with this. Uh, the marriage equality is its a great thing, and it did move uh, the movement forward quite a bit. But it didn't do a lot of things, and it didn't do everything. Um, there's still a lot of issues that re- revolve around marital rights and how uh, same-sex couples can actually enjoy the thousand-plus benefits that are out there for you know at the federal level for uh, married couples. The Texas uh, Bar Association just recently, um, their LGBT section um, went over a number of things that had to be changed to accommodate this mm-hmm. whole idea that you know marriage equality is reality. That took a year for them to get to that point. So there are still a lot of things happening. Um, when you get into basic Texas law, and basically at the federal level, there is no blanket protection. There is no Equality Act that has been enacted. And in Texas, there's only one state law that mentions any protection for LGBT people, and that's the James Byrd Hate Crimes right, Act. That's correct. That includes sexual preference as right. uh, something that's protected. Sexual preference. That's not, a, not orientation. No, and that, I mean that, that, and it never says anything about gender identity or expression. Right. And that's that's something that we really need to talk about too uh, during the show because you know so many issues around transgender uh, concerns as they age or you know, overall. Um, so and even right now when they try to go to the restroom, right? right. Yeah. But, you know the, the medical uh, aspect of the, 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 you know be, just being a transgender person you know becomes very complicated. And you want to talk about doctors that are going to you know shy away from treatments because they don't understand people. There, it, we did do a session yesterday on uh, transgender issues, and one of the participants on the panel said that basically you get about an hour in your second year of medical school talking about transgender issues. That's pathetic. It is pathetic. Wow. You know, it, re- it reminds me, though, years ago and during my HRC days, um, we would go to, to D.C. Like, twice a year, Aaron and I both, and um, one, of the, one of the panels one year was um, um, a, a, several people from the business world, and one guy was an out LGBT executive at Walmart. And he talked about the fact that Walmart had had instituted this um, non-discrimination um, policy within the company, and they were so gung ho about it, they wanted to take out ads and the Advocate. They wanted to, you know, put floats into pride parades. And he's like, no, 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 you have to, you have to pull back. You know, it's you know, people in within our company are going to kind of laugh and be a little scared if we don't make this real within the company because you know we the, the that lesbian in Birmingham Alabama uh, can read the policy and just go right 
you know, they're not going to discriminate right. against me and my job right. because it's not real. They hadn't done the training. They hadn't rolled it out. Um, and, and so there's a lot of that in every organization um, mm-hmm. that has to happen. Are, are you finding that, that making it real, even if that they do have a policy, is, is a challenge? Yes. And um, also to your question, Laron. When the law passed, um, there are LGBT-friendly facilities that quickly want to get up to speed, but they don't know how. Uh, those facilities have approached us. We have, as Bart mentioned, um, we are focused on creating an assessment tool that will measure how culturally sensitive that facility is and identify where the training gaps are. So many facilities are like, hurry, please assess us, because we think that we're pretty progressive. And we also, uh, those those facilities also want to get in, they want the business, they want to get the LGBT families in there. It, but one thing that came out yesterday, Robert Emery has been very involved yes. in uh, speaking to different facilities That's across right. North Texas. And he said when he talks to them at first and asks them, you know, because he kind of goes in like a secret shopper, and he finally reveals that his lesbian mother is who he's putting in here. That's right. And will she be welcome here? Well, sure, they're very accepting. Yes. His second question is, well, what programs do you have for her that that will keep her mind active, that will keep her interested, that will keep her healthy? And the answer is, well, nothing right now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, but well, see, and that's the difference um, for so our for our one thing. Yeah, yeah, for our first crop of of assessment, those that reach out to us, okay, we'll talk. Mm-hmm. But for you to do uh, blind shopping and just go in the way Robert has done at that moment where he was five years ago, I mean, that's basically all you could do. And that was part of the the reason to even form the coalition is because we don't have a book that I can scroll down through here and say these are five facilities in that particular area of Texas that I think your mother would be okay in. Um, For those that have reached out to us, and and I'll give you an example, like Presbyterian Services, very progressive organization, and they very quickly want all of their staff assessed uh, they're interested in, in changing the culture uh, because b- before our show, uh, Portia brought up a, a valid concern is when you start forcing people to um, take care of an LGBT person, how do you know the LGBT person's safe? Mm-hmm. And, and more basically, I've always told Rafiq, I don't want a baker cooking my wedding cake that doesn't want to cook my cake, you know. So um, the thing is we've got to get in and touch the culture, and we can do that. Um, and then it'll self-regulate itself, you know, uh, the the same as what's going on in the police force. You know, if you there know, are bad people, then we just the, – the good people are just going to have to stand up. Well, what it really comes down to, though, if you heard that there was somebody working at this facility – you're seriously considering going there, Kenan, but you've really heard they're not great with black people. Yeah. And it's it's really just several of their employees. Do you want those nurses helping you? Exactly. exactly. You know, when you find out somebody doesn't like black people, they don't like gay people, they don't like Jewish people, they don't like Muslims, they don't like this one, they don't like... Yeah. They don't like anybody. Yeah. I don't want that kind of person helping me at all i want to know that the nursing home realized when somebody has a problem with an elderly person i don't care what it's for they got rid of them right it's sometimes it's not a matter of training you know and it's a level of training is how can we make this person healthier happier exactly more integrated into our facility but when you have to start training a caregiver that it's just a person. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, uh, the problem in the general population, and I used to be one of those these people also, that when you think of um, workers of the, um, the medical field, whether it be a doctor, nurse, medical assistant, whatever, you think these are some of the most honest people in any field in the country. You would think, but right. you got to remember, 
their people also. They right. come with their own baggage and their own religious um, views or prejudice also. So the training is is absolutely needed. Um, yeah. it, that, that's just for anybody. Glenn, I think too many of us before we even came out, how many gay people had we been around? And so it, it's an education process that we're going to have to just carefully step through with them. And for us on the coalition, we're, we can do that. I mean, through uh, Bart's research and his research committee and partnering with other uh, points of academia, we can do this. Well, I think, too, there's a, there's a move away from the idea of, of teaching sensitivity to teaching competence. Right. And competence in serving others um, is, is really, I think, um, a, a great focus because we do live in a world where we're all out here. We're, you know, every, you, talk, you work with the general public, you're going to encounter everybody. You're going to encounter every level of socioeconomic um, advantage and disadvantage. And, yeah. and race, religion, creed, I mean, pick something. We're, we're all out here. And, and you have to be competent in dealing with the general public. Well, and that's interesting you should say that because what I've learned in the last year is in talking to so many people about this subject and service providers, there is a huge difference between homophobia and just straight up hatred. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so many in our own community and in the media will simply say it's homophobia. That is not homophobia. That is homo hatred, is what's going on there. And, you know, that. It, it, for those people, um, if they want to build walls around themselves and isolate themselves, then let them let that process go on, because the rest of us who are interested in this competency. Uh, but, but that person doesn't belong in a field where they're caregiving, where they're hands on helping somebody. But I think there's a greater thing going on, a bigger thing going on here, and it's not only in 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 this particular topic. I really think there uh, there's a divide that's occurring, and those that are willing to travel down that road of LGBT competency uh, and accepting of of race and and all these points of diversity, um, and then those that aren't, and those that aren't. Uh, it's evolution. It's, it's simply Let's talk a little to... bit. Let's talk a little bit about some specifics. Okay. What are some things? The, the well, no, no, I was just going to get Portia in here. She had, she is a nurse, right? I mean, what was it like when you went through training? I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll assume they didn't specify LGBT, but how, how do they address um, when you're dealing with just all different kinds of people when you're training? When I was in nursing school, the focus was on people from different countries. It wasn't even talked about that there were people who were lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered. And I think now that the focus is on, there's so, well, we're everywhere, that that old saying, we're everywhere. But, so I think that they may start to address it, but to the best of my knowledge now, there is no training about how to take care of or how to uh, even assess someone (coughs) who is LGBT. And we're not quite everywhere. Pete Sessions has said there aren't any gay people in his district. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And and by the way, his campaign headquarters is in this building. Oh, okay. And and he covers Oak Lawn, so... But there aren't any, any, you know, any 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 queer people there. As the transgender on the panel pointed out yesterday, one-hour training through the latter part of of the entire medical school... um, that's terrible. It's awful. So the challenge that she made to the Coalition for Aging LGBT was, uh, because one of her, one of the questions from the audience is, well, what do we do about this? Well, the reply was, you get into the med schools. So now we, we're going to have to, as the board, go back, okay, do we need to form a medical committee? We've got a legislative committee. Do we need to form a medical committee? We can do this. There are plenty of people... Uh, Dr. Brady Allen was in one of those breakout sessions yesterday. There's enough people that we already know in the medical field that we can get into those med schools. And again, from the superior capitalistic, um, th- this particular transgender, t- it was her niece who was actually going through med training. And she says, 
if you go back and you study more about this topic and move to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I guarantee you I can give you more patience than you know what to do with. Well, yeah, but but that just makes sense. We're not talking about this costing anybody anything. In fact, in a nursing home, if you're healthier, you'll live longer, so you're going to have you're going to have a steady stream of income there, right? Um, and it'll be easier when you you don't have this turnover because your patients are lasting. Your patients live longer. Well, that's something. Our patients live longer than uh, than average. Why? Because we give them such good. Why is this at all in any way a controversial or odd way of approaching? Care? I agree. I agree, and I think on an intellectual side, I mean, I would think it would be very stimulating and professionally developing, um, but there are some unique medical things that the transgender panel ex- uh, disclosed yesterday that I was not aware of. For example, um, uh, she mentioned that if you go in for certain tests for kidney function, uh, heart function, and they take they draw blood from you, it's important to know whether they're taking it from a female or a male. So they have to conduct these tests on both uh, sexes. And so she is former military. She has all of her work done at a VA hospital. And so it says female, but also has the T at the end of it to show that she's a transgender patient. So that everyone at the hospital knows to run both tests for this particular patient, male and female. So that's which, just which is, I hate to say this is progressive, but there's lots of insurance policies that won't cover a transgender male who right. still has ovaries. Yes. Well, they can get ovarian cancer. Sorry, you're a male. You're not yep. covered. Exactly. Trans women who get prostate cancer. Or, yes. But uh, I thought one of the really fascinating points on that was that since the Defense Department and the VA have changed their policies mm-hmm. and recognized you know, transgender uh, issues, uh, they are bringing the whole system along. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, that's a great hopeful sign that other hospitals, medical uh, providers can, you know, uh, copy basically what the VA is doing in terms of uh, things like putting the T next to the, the M or F marker. Uh, we need to take a potty break. We're talking about aging in the LGBT community. <laughs> Our guests are Portia Cantrell, Sam Tornabeni, um, Mark Poche, and Cannon Flowers. I'm Dave Taffet here with Lauren Landis and the late Patty Fink. And Josh, take it away. Hey guys, I'm Stevie Curden, and you're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. We're on the air. Everybody's busy talking. <laughs> yeah. Good topic. Um, we're talking about aging in the LGBT community. Yesterday was the second annual Summit on Aging. It was held up in Collin County. There's going to be another Summit on Aging on November 4th in the November 12th. November 12th. 12th, okay. In Tarrant County. In Tarrant yeah, County. the election. Right. Yeah. yeah. Very wise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Laurent. Well, I just wanted to talk a little bit about housing. Um, but growing up, um, I had, you know... Um, many Asian friends, and I noticed that all of them, or most of them, had like their grandmother or their great-grandparent living with them. And I found that in their in their traditions, that was just common. You took care of your grandparent. Um, you know, they didn't live in a living facility. They didn't live in a nursing home. So I've always jokingly said, that's why I want to have a kid. Yeah. I want to... You know, put in their heads, you have to take care of daddy. So I have a kid now, so I, I tell her all the time, you have to take care of daddy when, when daddy gets older. Now, wh- whether that really pans out or not, who knows. But the, the series of this is, what can we do to prepare ourselves? Because, again, if we're lucky, we all are going to get there at some point. Well, you can have a different kid. <laughs> no, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm not aging. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, you know, it just to prepare that we are in uh, our wishes are granted, either that we stay home and hire help, or we are going to th- the best facility that's for us. Well, you know, one of the challenges is that we've seen is the family of choice that happens in our community. Um, and we we love everybody that's in our life, but they're usually the same age we are, and we all age together. And so, you jokingly, who's going to die first among you know the four or five of us? So, 
where we as a culture are suffering hugely is this intergenerational aspect and it's sad uh, and we've got to get smarter about it we have got youth uh, 5.2 million homeless LGBT youth uh, and anybody over 45, you know, I always talk about the margins in our community, 21 to 45. If you're in between there and you look reasonably well, you're going to be just fine. But if you're below it, uh, we really don't have much use for you. In fact, we historically haven't even had a place for you to assemble because uh, you couldn't get into a bar below 21. So we didn't, we, we lost all that youth. Uh, and so we're, quickly trying to figure out how to, how to build structure for them. So on the, on the other end, the 45 plus. So the next step in, in that whole process is we've got to find ways to bring these two together. I know uh, from my own personal experience uh, that I relied on my grandparents and great aunts and uncles for, uh, for a lot of advice, but I was held accountable to a lot of people and uh, more than just your parents. And somehow we've got, we've got to get that. We need that culture back for this village. Um, and I think if you looked at any anthropological study, it would show that uh, through four or five generations of that behavior, and I don't think it can sustain itself. Um, and I don't know what that looks like. But And do you know what I think a lot of people in our community have thought? Um, that we did such a good job of taking care of each other during the AIDS crisis right. that you know it took five or six people to care for one person yes. and then another person in that group died and you brought two or three more people in and somebody from that group died and you brought two or three more people in a- and I guess that's kind of what I always had in mind that right. you know we we have a group here or we'll put together a group when either I need care or uh, you know, Patty has, you know, she's lucky she married somebody a lot younger than she is. Um, <laughs> How much did Aaron pay you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's two and a half years younger than me. Uh, oh, 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 that's oh, Robin okay. Cradle. Two and a half years younger. Okay, sure. Uh-huh. Um, you know, have any of you thought of it that way, too? Portia, you had to have given a lot of care during the AIDS crisis. Sam? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think what you're saying is exactly what I would expect, that, you know, you would do the same thing that we did back then and you would you would care for each other what i think is is important to remember though is in a place like dallas you can probably do that because you do have a big enough community you have protections that are you know given to us on a local level and and there's there's a, a fair you know fairly vibrant community here when you get out of dallas per se or, or fort worth um things start to fall apart pretty quickly for people i mean you, you have people that are still totally in the closet Go east 30 miles yeah. and beyond. I and mean, it's there's there's nothing for them. And, you know, whatever age you are, you're, you're finding yourself with a with a struggle just to deal with issues that we all dealt with in the 70s. Right. Well, and I think, too, you have to remember that we saw AIDS as, uh, as it was. It was a cause. Uh, and that's one of the biggest struggles that the Coalition for Aging LGBT has is for me to convince our community this is a cause that you need to get behind. And if we got everybody to see it as a cause, uh, I could, it, we could deal with isolation. We could deal, we could reinstitute the, uh, reinstitute the buddy system that saved us through the AIDS crisis. So there's so many things that, uh, that that would, if, if what's in your head, David, of how you were going to make it, if I could get everybody to, to, okay, let's go back to the buddy system, the way we saved our AIDS patients, uh, or at least helped them through that hospice period, uh, we'd be just fine. There's some there's some innovative things happening though. I know in in, yes. in Scandinavia, for example, there I can't remember which city it is, but the the housing crisis is just I mean it's just you know astronomically expensive to live in the city, and there's so many college students that um, are unable to to do that. They exactly. can't pay those rents, and so they found um, elderly people who kind of like we do in assisted living, where um, you know here where they they open up a room and rent it to a college kid yeah um and they're there and they're to help them 
and more than more than maybe the physical help, they probably take the trash out and that sort of thing. But people are reasonably self sufficient um, in 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 these programs. Um, but they're there for the contact, for the for the move away from isolation, for the engagement of someone there living there, coming and going every day. You know, talking about new things every day. You eat better when you're. Yeah, with somebody. I mean, yeah. and they found that it's, it's incredibly successful. And it allows these college kids to live in the city, get to and from their classes, um, and and have a wonderful, um, you know, they they learn to see these these elderly people that they're living with and sharing their homes as mentors. Yeah, they get to share yep. that great wisdom that they. You get all sorts of sage. I mean, it's just uh, yeah, you can't even put a price on it. And I believe that there are young people in our community that want that those relationships, but we don't have a structure today. The social. No. The social. Social was one yeah. of them. Did you go to that, Kenan? I'm, I moderated that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I was there for both of them. Okay, were you listening? I was. Okay. <laughs> and one of the, the best ideas that came out of that, uh, we had good audience participation. There were people there from various organizations, and, and the, the Gay Volleyball League, uh, I can't remember what that is called. Diva. Yeah. Diva. Diva. Um, they, uh, this is just one example. They said they were looking for, like, young team members, older team members. And they didn't know who to ask to get older team members. So now they know who to ask to get older team members. The one suggestion that came up also in both of our breakout sessions was that the coalition needs to be putting, uh, events up on Meetup, uh, and find other organizations and say, hey, are you okay if we include 50 and older in your group? Because most of them, many of the audience said that they would love to, to in, include the older ones, but they don't know how to reach them. So it's just another action for us. But I think, too, another kind of, you know, we're, we're talking about all the social media. Uh, Meetup seems so... You know, 2003. But, it um, was so interesting. It came up in both sessions. That's and it was, interesting. It, and it was brought up by me and, and they both said the very same thing. And these are two separate sessions. Use Meetup. Meetup's a good thing. And I know it's not used for sex. <laughs> and everybody in the room is like, oh, my. Oh, it's like, if you have a chihuahua, let's get a play date. It's or a chihuahua a sexual play. meet up. And we're like, oh, dear. Like, <laughs> and then Candy Markle, who's in yeah. the room, said, only the men would think of that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, another one is next door. I mean, yeah. I don't know how many yeah. people, are, you know, especially rural areas, probably don't use next door. But, yeah. you know, next door is that all the neighborhood associations seem to yeah. be moving toward it. Yeah. Um, and that's a great way to say, you know, what are some things that incorporate and have things for people who are 45 and older mm-hmm. you know and not just the commercials that advertise life insurance right those you know i got i got my package from the aarp on not a few days before a few days after nope, they're good. on they're good at that. my 50th birthday yeah mike mckay said <laughs> that. Not, not cool time. not cool <laughs> Yeah, no, Mike, we joined. We Mike finally joined. said that very same thing in his closing speech yesterday. My father, <laughs> my father got me a membership for my 50th birthday. I looked at it and I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we were thinking about putting together a hookup app, like a grinder for the elderly called Denture. <laughs> Denture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Without the you. <laughs> Without the you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that was Sam, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Always thinking that guy, right? <laughs> you gotta you gotta you gotta make a buck off of this stuff. You know? <laughs> Which you'll use to fund additional programs. That's that's you know, Ed, but one of the things that I heard yesterday that's such a simple thing was one woman said I go to a potluck dinner once a month and I look I so look forward to it every month. And that's such a simple thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, in my mind, I was thinking, well, any group could easily put together a potluck dinner, do it as a regular thing, and um, you know, just kind of spin it off, and you start putting together groups mm-hmm. that do a, a once a month or once every so often potluck dinner, just for people to get together. You know, yeah, that's so simple. Since we're talking about socializing, in you know, when you get older, and if you're living alone in your house. And if your kids are off in a way, you live in other cities, um, if you're 
friends that you've been had, like you said, can't another around your same age. They may not be around, so you may not see as many people. Is it better to be in a living facility? Because you definitely will be around people a lot. I think it depends. Yeah, um, one of the my other hats is the senior affairs commissioner for the city of Dallas. So I meet with a lot of different people on that particular topic, uh, and it really depends on the personality. There's a, a fellow commissioner who is 86 years old and serves with me. Uh, and we had a meeting over at C.C. Young, which is one of the nicest senior facilities here in Dallas. It's one of those step-ups. Yeah. Uh, it goes from full un- fully independent to fully dependent. Right. Living. To where it's like 12000 a month. I mean, you're living in some posh quarters wow. over there. Uh, um, could but, you have them send Patty and Aaron? Yeah, but it didn't sure. start there. <laughs> they, <laughs> that's close to their neighborhood, actually. Anyway, so fellow commissioner, 86 years old. Mm-hmm. We had a wonderful visit. It's a beautiful place. And as we're walking to the car, he says to me, he says, Kenan, you know, as beautiful as it is, I hope I don't ever find myself in a place like this. Interesting. Yet there was another commissioner that she was like, oh, I would love to live in a place like this. So, yeah, I think it just socially depends. One of the things that we've seen in in all aging processes is people lose their relevancy. They don't even know where they fit anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that was a theme that we were pushing so hard yesterday is I am relevant. And and how do we... No, the word was revelant. Revelant. Uh, Poor (laughs) Kay. She struggled a couple of times. (laughs) Hey, Wilkins and our MC. <laughs> but then she has the audience to help her to say it, and she finally got it. I am relevant. Uh, and so, and, and when you lose that, um, I think that's when the isolation increases and, and the downward health uh, starts occurring. So, uh, as long as you're aware of it, and in those breakouts, the social breakout session, all of those ideas are just to fight that, losing your identity kind of thing. Uh, Rebecca Covell was in the one, one of the breakout social breakout sessions. Our listeners are familiar with Rebecca. She's been on the show many times. Yeah, and Rebecca made a good point, and that is um, get involved in a cause. Uh, and see, for our community, and I made this point in my opening remarks, is many of us spend our entire lives working on marriage equality or HIV funding. And so now we've made, we've made huge progress in those two areas. And so the lands, and landscape has changed to the point now that, you know, they're looking, people are looking, okay, now what do we do now? Um, and so, yeah, Rebecca made the point. This is the new cause, and, you know, we all need to engage, and, and, and it's it's wonderful. You know, what are we going to do as we age? We have one minute. What would you like to see, Portia, go on over the next year? I'm sorry, repeat yeah, What would you like to see go on as a result of this uh, conference yesterday? I would like to see healthcare personnel that don't stop to think about what I do in my personal life. Mm-hmm. I would just like for them to look at me and see a person and know that person needs to be taken care of. Sam? I'd like to see uh, LGBT aging issues become more part of the fabric of all of the things that we deal with in the LGBT world. Uh, Bart? I think similar. I would like to see visibility lead to more non-LGBT organizations become more interested in and um, competent in dealing with LGBT people. Good. I want to thank all of you for being here with us. Um, we are just about out of time, and uh, next week we'll be talking about youth issues, actually. Yeah. Thank you. This is William, hopefully your favorite videographer from 2X Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below, or like, follow, or subscribe to us, and get notices of all our videos. We love it, even when you call. <laughs>